The Ministry of Secondary Education has developed a distance learning platform for students of secondary education in Cameroon. A series of lessons taught by qualified teachers for secondary school students. Under the stewardship of Professor Pauline Nalovalyonga, in collaboration with the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications, CAMTEL, CRTV and UNESCO. We are introducing distance learning as another teaching and learning method which is different from the traditional classroom setting that you are all used to. In the distance education mode, you are not with the teacher in person, so take your time, relax, listen to the teacher, take down notes and visit the following links for any questions or answers to your questions. Take it in your stride. This is Cameroon's solution to COVID-19 and beyond. Professor Nalova Lyunga, Minister of Secondary Education. Welcome to another body lesson for Lower Seat. I'm your distant uh, learning instructor for this class of biology, and my name is Dama Charles Popka. Before we go into a lesson proper, remember that I gave you an assignment in the last lesson, and the assignment was for you to collect information, dates and major events, how the cell was discovered. Because the information we have about the cell today is not, is not just in one day, it took centuries. So you can have an appreciation of how long it took to develop the ideas that we read in books today. So we're going to look at the assignment. And the first date there is 1595. Remember 15th century, that's when Jensen was credited with the first compound microscope. So these guys already were thinking about uh, microscopy. So Jensen was created for the first microscope. microscope. After that, he left the work halfway. Then Robert Hooke in 1655 came and described, used microscope to describe cells in a, in, in a cock material. And he saw that the cells had many small holes. That was 1655. So you can appreciate already how far scientists, uh, how long scientists started work. In 1674, there's another scientist called Lewin Hawk. He discovered protozoa. He saw bacteria some nine years later using lenses. So he observed them in nature and he found that there are some tiny organisms that, that when they magnify with this lens. In 1833, so Brown described the cell nucleus in the cells of an orchid. So the components of the cell that we have big understanding today were discovered piecemeal and it took a long time. Now in 1838, there were uh, two uh, scientists, two German scientists, Schleden and Schwann, they proposed the cell theory. It means that the, the cell theory, they generalized some of these findings about the cell, which are going to see what the theory is. And in 1840, uh, Albert von Rock-Lika uh, realized that sperm cells and egg cells were also cells. So it didn't take uh, a short time to discover all this. And in 1856, there is Prick, uh, Prickshem observed how a sperm cell penetrated an egg cell. So it saw that two cells can come together. And we're, we're uh, getting those details in the recent day publications. So that was 1856. So it was a long time. In 1858, another uh, physician, pathologist and anthropologist called Robert Rod Rodolf Vischer expounded his famous conclusion. He calls it omnicellular. Uh, and this was a publication that showed, showed that cells develop from pre-existing cells. That's what that Latin expression they mean. Cells come from pre-existing cells. So we now already see what they found out in those long times that cells can divide to form other cells. And in 1857, there was colica described the mitochondrion as an organelle. And then 1879, uh, Fleming described chromosome behaving during mitosis. So they were discovering them in bits, in scattered bits. And we're going to see that all were put together into a meaningful 
um, declaration. In 1883, germ cells uh, are haploid, and the chromosome theory of hereditary was also elucidated. And then Golgi, we know about the Golgi bodies, describe uh, Golgi bodies, describe the Golgi apparatus. So we see that in all several structures there is the Golgi apparatus. So he named that apparatus after his name. In 1938, we're coming close already. In 1938, Berings Be Be used the functional certification. That's a very important method for technique for studying the cell. We're going to study it uh, shortly to come. Differential centrifugation to separate nuclei from the cytoplasm. So remember that, remember that if you crush cells from a hibiscus leaf, for example, and you use differential centrifugation, and you can separate the nucleus, separate the mitochondrion. So it separated nuclei, isolated nuclei. In 1939, Siemens produced the first commercial transmission microscope. Remember that. Uh, transmission microscope will magnify objects greatly. You can see very tiny things with that one. In 1952, Gray and his co-workers established a continuous human cell line. So they worked a lot on human cells and they brought a lot of information about the human cell. In 1955, uh, another scientist called Eagle systematically defined the nutritional needs of animal cells in culture. So they worked a lot with cultural media, grew cells in cultural media, and worked out the nutritional needs. So isolating cells and making the nutritional needs can also have information that can help us uh, in our own physiology. Now in 1957, we, already saw, we just saw Michel Star and Venograd develop density gradient certification. Remember that when they cultured E. coli and, uh, in N15 and N14, they used density gradient centrifugation with sensing chloride to see how uh, the, 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 the position of the various DNAs will be. That's what helped them to conclude that DNA replication is by a semi-conservative process. So that was the work of Michelson, Skull, and Venograd in 1957. We're coming closer to the recent dates. In 1965, Hamdi introduced and defined serum-free uh, media and uh, used um, a Cambridge instrument produce, uh, uh, using Cambridge instrument, he produced the first commercial scanning microscope. Now, look at it now. We saw the transmission microscope, microscope and now the scanning electron microscope. Those are types of microscopes that we're going to study in the course of this lesson, in the course of for a subsequent lesson. We're going to look at them, look at the advantages and how they are used. In 1976, Sato and his colleagues published papers showing that differential cell lines require different mixtures of hormones and growth factors in a cerebral free medium. So a lot of work had been done, a timeline. In 1981, we saw transgenic mice and fruit flies were produced. So transgenic mice are produced from a result of biotechnology. We hear that they've been producing transgenic mosquitoes now. So all those things are developments that were started long ago. Mouse embryonic stem cell lines were established in 1998. Mice could be cloned from somatic cells. So they get cells of the somatic, the somatic cells are cells that are not germinal, are cells that are not germinal. They don't concern the reproductive system. So every cell that's out of the reproductive system is a somatic cell. And so they use these cells and they produce mice. In 1999, Hamilton and Borel Combe discover uh, uh, RNA as part of a post-transcriptional uh, gene silencing. Those are very high technologies. So, but the idea is that they started talking about, about DNA. So that is not all about the discovery. Even in the 20th century, if you read recent publications, you're going to see a lot of them. So at least we have given you a rundown on the timeline, dates, and major events that uh, led, to our, of, or, or, or led to our understanding of cell structure and function. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. 
So now to the cell discovery and theory, and the first part of the lesson will concentrate on cell discovery, and the next lessons will concentrate on cell theory. So cell discovery and theory, one, of course, we're going to run it through from objectives to prerequisite information to real life situations, lesson activities, exercises, and assignment. So we're going to follow that plan. And of course, the objective of this is to describe the key events that led to the discovery of the cell, not the generalization of cell, the discovery of cell. What did each one do? Cell discovery. So that is very important. Cell discovery. So we have uh, spiritual good knowledge. We have knowledge on the cell. In our previous classes, I've been studying cells in form 5, studying cells in form 4, studying cells in form 3. So we have some basic knowledge. We know what a cell is. So we're going to build on that knowledge again to bring it to a level of uh, lower seat. So of course, a real life situation is that every activity that sustains the living organism occurs in the cell. So it doesn't occur out of the cell. Every living organism, everything that sustains the body occurs within the cell. Because we're going to see that the cell is the unit of structure and function. So we're going to see that. Again, our hypothesis is that uh, without the discovery of cells, the structure and function of an organism could not be fully understood. So most of the things that we understand is from the studying of one cell, experimentation of one cell. I mean, doing all kinds of uh, findings within the cell. And then we we'll make a generalization and know how the whole body, how they integrate together to function. Of course, the new hypothesis is, uh, is that the discovery of the cell has no relationship with a full understanding of structure and functioning of the organism. Of course, at the end of the lesson, we're going to see which one to throw out. We're going to see how we throw out the alternative hypothesis or we throw out the new hypothesis. So that's very important. So how were cells first discovered? Again, it's going to be a historical approach. We're going to look at people who discovered them and talk a bit how they discovered it. Of course, the first time the word cell was used to refer to those tiny units of life was in 1665 by the British scientist named Robert Hooke. So Robert Hooke was the first to discover cells and to coin the name cells. So Hooke was one of the earliest scientists to study living things under a microscope. So his art, his ability to, to grind lenses and use a build up lenses and construct magnifiers gave him the, the uh, opportunity to observe this cock cell. So uh, uh, it, was, it, was, it was that activity that brought the cock cell. So what did he do? The microscope of his days were not very strong. So, but Hooke still was able to make important discovery. So imagine if Hooke had electron microscopes that we have today, he would have made better discovery, but he built a foundation on which electron microscopes and even compound microscopes can be, can be used. When he looked at the thin slice of cock under the microscope, he was surprised to see what looked like honeycomb. So Hooke made the drawing of those tiny honeycomb cells to show what he saw. So imagine at that time he wanted to represent so that other scientists can see what he, what he saw within the cock cells. So look at what Hooke saw. Look at this. It looks like tiny cells in a honeycomb. So those are the cells of cock, the cock cells. So Robert Hooke's cells that he saw with his microscope. Imagine the tiny cells. If you look at the cock, you don't see these tiny cells, but under the microscope, you are able to see. Even with this underdeveloped microscope, he was able to see these magnificent uh, structures called cells. Again, let's look at Hooke's microscope. Hooke's microscope is, was not modern. It had an eyepiece. So it means that modern microscopes have been developed on the basis of Hooke's um, build-up. It had a barrel. This is what we call the, the body tube, through which light will pass to meet the eyepiece. It had a focusing screw. This is what we have as coarse and fine adjustment buttons, so it could adjust. It had an objective. Ob objective, we have objective uh, lenses that can, on the rotating nose piece in a microscope that we saw in the previous lessons. 
So even though this structure, this microscope of Robert Luke was very rudimentary, and look at the time he created this in 1670, it was very important. Now Luke saw that, Hook saw that, if he left this microscope as it is, and the specimen as it is, there was a problem of blurredness of the images and scattering of the rays. So he brought another strategy here, the oil lamp and the water flask, to be able to make sure that he removed the dispersion of light and other things to so that his image should be clear. So what a wonderful scientist. So that was the rudimentary microscope of Robert Hooke that he used to discover, to be able to discover the cock cells as clear as you see them. So if this apparatus was not there, the oil and the water flask, you would not be able to, 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 to control the light and uh, make the image clearer. So they were really geniuses in, the, in that time. So uh, Hooke used a biconcave, a biconvex objective lens and he placed it on a snot and two actual lenses, an eyepiece lens and a tube. We've seen that already. So we have the eyepiece, the barrel, the focusing screw, and so on. So we're just uh, trying to give you the parts of Robert Hooke's microscope. When combined, the lenses suffered from insufficient chromatic and spherical disturbances and yielded poor images, as I was telling you. So if you combine all this, it will be sufficient to produce the bright image that we have here. This bright image can be produced when you don't put the addition of this. So that is what Robert Hooke now had to, to do. So Hooke tempted, attempted to correct these aberrations, these alterations, by placing a small diaphragm into the optical pathway to reduce uh, refraction of light and to sharpen the image. He also passed the light generated from an oil lamp, I show the oil lamp. So to reduce bloodness, he passed the light through an oil lamp and through this water flask. So he passed the light through the oil lamp and that helped him to, to produce, to better illuminate uh, the samples. So what is the impact of a uh, Hooke's microscope? The invention of this Hooke's microscope led to the discovery of cell by Hooke. So it, it was a great impact that organisms are made of cells. So while looking at the cock, Hooke observed box-shaped structures which he called cells, as they reminded him of the prison rooms and cells, of the cells and you know, of the cells and rooms he saw in the monastery, that the monks were staying in small cubicles, small units. He said these cock cells, uh, and they called themselves. So he reminded himself that this what he saw on the cock were just comparable to the rooms of the of the monks in the monastery that he had he had visited them. So he, he also called his own uh, compartments. Uh, cells. So this discovery of Hooke led to the development of the classical cell theory. In the next thing we're going to look about, talk about the cell theory. We're going to talk about the cell theory. So Hooke coined the word cell. So Hooke was the first to coin the word cell. So while looking at the thin, thin piece of the cock uh, under the microscope, Hooke saw these compartments of pores that reminded him of the monks living quarters in the monastery that were called cells. So there was an analogy that uh, helped hook. So of course, it is very important that his discovery was so important and his finding linked to the scientific study of cell, cell biology. So we now have cell biology. We have cell metabolism. We have cell uh, structure and function. We have cell molecular biology. All is because he discovered the cell first. So that's very important. And that led to the generalization that we're going to see in the cell theory. So, now there was also a discovery that cells were found in other organisms. There's some organisms that look like cells. So in 1673, Otto van Lewy, who we saw him before, uh, or uh, we saw him before, a Dutch businessman, made his own microscope. As a matter of fact, he didn't make one. He made many around 500 microscopes in the last in lifetime. So he made many microscopes. So he was trying possibilities. And the way he used one of his many microscopes to observe Pons com. And let me say that Pons com is very important. Uh, if, you, if you can produce Pons com, 
in a school environment where uh, you have done clearing, you have cleared grass, you can take the dry grass, put inside a bucket, and then put water and cover. After about a week, when you open it, you're going to see a, a whitish, whitish layer. If you pipette that layer, pipette the liquid, that whitish liquid, and you place it on a microscope slide, you're going to observe paramecia. You're going to observe amoeba forming pseudopodia. You're going to observe all protoctista. You're going to observe. I did that once, and I saw that the paramecia were moving too fast. So what you can do is, in a pond scum, is you immobilize, use a cotton wool to immobilize those uh, protists from moving. And you can magnify to see a paramecia, the sleeper animalcule. So Levine, who was the, was the first who tried to observe these things under the microscope of the pond scum, where you can produce uh, your own scum. So he found that there were so many other organisms in the pond scum, and he referred them as small animals or animalcules, animalcules, and that is why uh, he kept on looking for these small animals within the pond scum, and he found that there were a variety of them. He could look at them uh, smaller and smaller things, um, uh, more than what Hook could do. So when Hook could only magnify small things of um, 20 to 30 times, Levin Hook could magnify up to 200 times. So that's why he could see the tiny protists in the skull. So Levin Hook's discovery was an advancement on Hook. was an advancement on Hook. So it is very important. So Levin Hook was able to look at animal blood and to see differences in the blood cells. So it was him who could talk about red blood cells that were biconcave, how uh, the white blood cells were, were amoeboid. It was because of his observation. He was also the first to see bacteria. So with his high magnification microscope. So that was possible. So another great discovery was to find out, by the level who found out that some other cells could be living organisms. So that was important. So have a look at Levin Hook's variety. He saw this type of things he saw under the microscope. You can see a lot of small animals magnified. You can see small animals magnified. So that was uh, Levin Hook's drawing. But in a modern day, we can have better drawings of this uh, specimen, protist, and a variety from the skull. So that was a picture from Levin Hook's observation. And he, when he observed, he tried to draw them so that other scientists uh, could see. Uh, another con great contributor to the cell discovery was Matthias Jacob Sladen, and he contributed to the cell discovery. And uh, he discovered and concluded that all plant tissues are composed of cells. The plant matter is composed of cells, and that an embryonic plant arose from a single cell. So he was the one who discovered that, and he declared that the cell is the basic building block of plant matter. So he discovered that plants have cells. So that was a discovery that was important towards the generalization of the cell theory. So Matthias Jacob Sladen was um, the first. Then Chido Schwann worked like uh, 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 Matthias Jacob Sladen and he discovered now for animals that in the same way the uh, uh, Schleden discovered for plants, he also saw that animals had these cells. All animals are made up of cells. So it was a discovery that he made in 1839. We're going to see in subsequent lesson that this combination of discoveries led to a generalization we call theory. And that is a cell theory. So they made this generalization. And that is very important. Of course, there was another great contributor to cell discovery and that was Rudolf Vischel. And he did that between 1821 and 1902. And he was um, the founder of the field of cellular pathology. So his work within this time, he was a physician, so he could discover a lot of things in how cells uh, are related, cell function is related to pathology. And today in medicine, we know a lot about cells and pathology. So the, the founder, the ancestor for that is uh, Rudolf Vischer. So he stressed that most of the diseases of mankind could be understood in terms of dysfunction of the cell, and that is true. 
Most of the disease we have is dysfunctioning of the cell, even the structure and metabolic activity, because all is held within the cell. So it was vision that made a good foundation for medical pathology. So through uh, working with specific cells. So vision also published a statement that cells arise from pre-existing cells. So he was the one who, who made us to understand that a cell can divide, can divide to produce another cell and produce other cells. So this was the basis of a mother a cell differentiating to form other specialized cells. It was also believed that new cells were created from a fruit, uh, a fruit called blast, blastema, and his work led to scientists to bring uh, to be able to diagnose diseases more accurately. So they contributed to cell and cell functioning that form a great foundation, a great foundation of cell cellular knowledge. Now, if we go back to our real life, we now see that cells cannot exist, and for that we cannot uh, exist without uh, the functioning of cells. Cells form a, 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 a foundation for the functioning of, our, of, our, of, of life, for functioning of the human body. So it's very important to take note about the real life. We said in the real life, um, we said, in the real life, that every activity that sustains the living organism occurs in cells. So we are now concluding that cell without cells, there will be no activities within um, the organism. So cells are the important uh, foundation for cell activity. About the hypothesis, we will hold the hypothesis that the discovery of cells is the foundation for us to fully understand how living organisms function. From the understanding of one cell, we understand how the rest of the organism function and how all the cells are interrelated in their functions. Of course, the assignment we'll have for next class is that we'll distinguish between theory, law, and hypothesis. You will have to distinguish between theory, law, and hypothesis because next time we'll be talking about a lot of cell theory. And you must understand the differences that exist between theory, law, and hypothesis. And of course, keep consulting uh, this manual, Comprehensive A-Level Biology Concepts and Applications, and other internet resources. You're going to get a lot of discoveries that were made about the cell, not only those that are mentioned here. There's also build up a good historical background. Of course, I will see you in the next lesson when we we'll start talking about cell theory. Una tege si ma tege yop, una tege minga ma tege nyum, una tege ma jang ma tege ndom, ma ne tambia niña ne injo biayen, ngani bana ma tege mot, ngani la kiri wa tege ndong, eso kina bia jinkido, ma ne tambia niña ne injo biayen, tam tama mote tam zabike. Tam tam a tonge tam zabike tam 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 a mote tam zabike mane tam bia niña ne injo bia yen 